Hello and welcome to the 25th Vermont Grazing and Livestock Conference. I would like to take a moment to thank our sponsors. I would like to thank the National Grazing Lands Coalition, Food Animal Concerns Trust, Morrison's Custom Feeds, Rural Vermont, and the Vermont Agency of Agriculture, Food and Markets. I would also like to thank our partners. I would like to thank the United States Department of Agriculture, National Institute of Food and Agriculture, and the National Resources Conservation Service. I would also like to thank Cedar Tree Foundation, and the Forest C. and Francis H. Latner Foundation. Thank you for joining us for the 25th Grazing and Livestock Conference. The conference is brought to you by the University of Vermont Extension Center for Sustainable Agriculture and the Vermont Grass Farmers Association. Enjoy the content. Uh, I'm Matt Garcia. I'm a board member of the Vermont, Grazing, uh, Vermont Grass Farmers Association, proud member. And um, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce Sarah Flack and I'll guide uh, initially the conversation um, with the question and answer that will eventually pull in some of the questions that are already flowing through um, the poll uh, for questions, the Q&A, and um, we'll engage with, with Sarah. So Sarah is an author and a consultant who specializes in providing practical information on grass-based and organic livestock production. Um, she personally is a sort of guru for me. I use her um, uh, book, The Art of Science of Grazing, uh, The Art and Science of Grazing, which is sort of my, my Bible for my own farm operation at Taste for Good Farm here in Thetford. Um, Sarah received her Bachelor's of Science in Environmental Agriculture and Biology and a Master of Science in Plant and Soil Science uh, from the University of Vermont. Uh, it is my distinct pleasure to welcome Sarah Flack. Welcome, Sarah. Okay, thanks. Am I unmuted now here? Yes, you are. Great. So, so um, yes. go ahead, so, Matt. Yeah, sorry. So, one of the things that we did uh, prior to this is uh, we loaded up um, three uh, webinars that Sarah did, um, and um, we're hopeful that you were able to access them. That will get us deeper into the uh, conversation about grazing. Um, but at this point, we wanted to uh, start with uh, a conversation about um, perhaps uh, fixing challenges on the farm. Um, and we talked a lot about weeds um, in the, the lead up uh, or preparation for this session. So um, definitely you all out there, get your weeds ready and ask questions about your weeds. But why don't we start there, Sarah, with uh, common problems and common solutions that you are um, engaging your farmers uh, about um, in Vermont. Sounds great. Yeah. So um, yeah, and thinking about how to approach this, the, the three pre-recorded webinars that everyone had available to watch, one was on grazing from the plants perspective, one was grazing from the livestock perspective, and then one got a little bit into kind of putting that information together and um, troubleshooting and really making sure your grazing system is meeting kind of the basic guidelines of grazing from for plants laid out in session number one and livestock in session number two. Um, but that third, the third webinar um, didn't have enough time to get into a ton of, of detail in kind of the, the troubleshooting. So, you know, what if you, now you kind of understand the basic guidelines of good grazing management, but you know, what if you've inherited a grazing system that is um, already suffering from overgrazing damage from previous years? Maybe it was yours um, that you did, or maybe, you know, you bought the farm or you inherited the farm and it was just the way the land was ma managed in the past. And so what do you do then? Um, you want to do good grazing management, but you've got weeds growing all over the place. Maybe you've got thin plant cover 
um, you know, low plant density, bare soil showing, you've got areas that just don't grow very well. Um, so how do you approach that? Um, so let's see if I can share some slides here. Um, oh, no, hang on. I think I have to, I think I have to put it to wood first here. Technology. No, all right, trying again here. It worked for me when you first did it there. Yeah, the, the screen share is working fine. It's just me being a Luddite. <laughs> oh. All right, there. Um, so yeah, I thought we might just start with all of these all of these problems, um, and um, starting with the you know a lot of the weed questions that have come in. And uh, for those of you who are just logging in now, you can um, look at the questions that have already come in. You can add new ones, and you can also kind of vote um, to uh, on questions that are already in there. So what's the what's the quickest way to fix problems that might be existing in your pasture? And um, what's the cheapest way? Um, and those are often not the same. There might be uh, an expensive, fairly quick fix, which would be, you know, I'm just gonna go in, I'm gonna totally renovate this pasture, I'm gonna till it up and reseed it. That's gonna cost you the most money. Uh, it's also kind of high risk because if you have poor soil moisture conditions or the wrong temperatures when you're doing that seeding, you're gonna potentially have a, a new seeding failure. And then even after new seeding, you have low plant density for a while and it can be very tricky to manage the weeds in there. So if you go in and just plow up your pasture, not realizing that you have a huge number of weed seeds in the soil already, uh, then you might actually be planting new seeds of weeds all over your pasture. Um, and, but, but sometimes tillage and reseeding is the way to go, but there's a whole lot of things you can do before you get to that point. Uh, including no-till drilling in some new seeds, maybe some frost seeding of legumes, some overseeding, even trample seeding. Um, there are some seeds that pass through the digestive systems of your livestock and will germinate in the manure, um, specifically the legumes. The grasses won't do that. Um, and so there's lots of different ways to approach that. And then there's also just taking a really hard look at your grazing management practices and seeing how you might be able to change the way that you're doing your grazing management to get the natural process of increasing the plant density in your pasture to get those weeds. Sometimes you might have a really major soil fertility imbalance. And, um, and so sometimes you need to fix the soil fertility for a while. Let's see, being told my internet connection is unstable. Um, all right. A little bit. So this okay. is kind of how, it's okay, good. This is yeah. kind of how um, I think about improving and, and dealing with um, pasture problems. The first thing I do is I look at the current and the past couple of years grazing management on the farm. This is where grazing records can be really helpful. And I see there's some questions that have come in on what type of grazing records to keep. And I'll talk about that in a little while. But if you've got really good grazing management um, records, when I come in as a consultant, um, my favorite thing are those um, grazing charts um, from holistic management because then I can look back through multiple years of pre previous grazing mm -hmm. records and I can see what was your period of occupation. So like how long did you leave them in each paddock? Maybe you left them in there a little bit too long and had some overgrazing damage. I can also see what was the recovery period? How long did you let those plants regrow after each grazing? And maybe you were having them regrow for too long and getting some shading in the understory from those tall bunch grasses. Maybe you were returning them to the paddocks too frequently and not letting those plants have adequate rest between grazings. 
So the first thing I'm going to do is dig into that and figure out like, okay, why do we have all these weeds or low plant density issues in the pasture from previous records? And then, um, then the next thing I'm going to do is look at the soil tests. And I would encourage you to get, um, you know, test your soils and make sure that if you're retesting your soils every couple of years, use the same lab so that we're able to really look at changes over time. I know there's all sorts of fun new soil tests out there, but if you get too into all of these different new soil tests, it actually gets harder to track changes over time. Um, so just a basic soil test that includes the um, macronutrients, the trace minerals. So we have things like boron, for example, and organic matter. That's That from the same lab is gonna give us enough information to look at changes over time. And then we can figure out if we've got a big soil fertility issue here. So it might be something like, I can't get legumes to persist in my pasture. They keep dying and all of a sudden I have all this Queen Anne's lace. And sometimes that's your potassium levels are low or your boron levels are low, which is making it hard for those legumes to persist long-term in your pasture. So once we've looked at the soils, once we've looked at how to correct the grazing management, this is then when I'll start thinking about reseeding and what method of reseeding, like a really drastic reseeding with tillage or whether we're gonna do some sort of a, a lighter impact seeding on the pasture. And this is also where I know there's been some questions that have already come in about, well, when is it appropriate to do some post grazing clipping to deal with some of these weed species? Um, or in some cases, you know, should I even be considering some herbicide in this weed eradication process? So um, this is one of the slides from one of the previous webinars that you can watch. Um, and those webinars I, I saw in the chat box, a couple of folks said they didn't get the opportunity to watch those. Um, those are available either through the WOVA site, they're available on my website, um, they're free, you can watch them anytime. Um, so when I talk about um, all of the things that we can do to fix our pastures and improve them, I kind of put it all together in what I call the grazers toolbox. And this list starting from the top going down to the bottom is um, what I think are the most important things at the top. I should have put humility at the top, not at the bottom. Um, <laughs> I added humility to the grazers toolbox as the impacts of climate change became more and more significant in my work. And it's gotten um, more challenging to figure out how to maintain good pasture quality and fix problems because we have these extended dry periods and these extended high, high rainfall events. Um, so yeah, we should put humility on the top. Um, so observation skills, varying your regrowth and recovery periods, changing your post grazing residual. That's how much plant material you've got attached to, um, be after the livestock graze. Uh, changing up how tall you let the plants grow before you graze them, changing the stocking rate, which is the total number of animals on the whole land base that you're managing, changing up the stocking density. That's where you'll hear people talk about mob grazing um, with a higher stocking density, more animals in a paddock at a specific time. There's also, um, I've got some handouts that go um, through a lot of this in some detail. It's like the Cliff Notes version of my book. Um, and it has a glossary in it that will um, define some of these terms if they're new to folks. Sampling is an amazing tool, which sometimes can really be the key to getting rid of some of these weed species. Um, so we'll talk about more, more about that. Um, fallowing is when you let a a pasture just grow and you don't graze it or mow it. And in some cases that can make the weed species much worse um, by allowing them to go to seed. Um, but in some cases that can be a helpful process of um, healing some damaged pastures. And then when we get to the point where none of that is working, then we can talk about uh, clipping to deal with weeds and problem plants, 
um, even you know mowing, maybe taking a field out of pasture production and making it into a hay field for a period of time to get it on a regular mowing schedule. For some people, you might consider the use of herbicides um, for targeted problems. Um, and then we've got the more radical and the most expensive options, which is tillage, um, aerating, seeding, um, you know, reseeding fertilizer. So this, um, these are the grazing guidelines. I won't go into them here because I talked about them extensively in the webinars, but um, this is always like the most important slide in each of my webinars that really talks about the key principles that are shared by all good grazing management systems. This variable recovery periods, short periods of occupation and not being fixed in this. So you're changing things up all the time based on your observation of whether your plants need more or less rest, whether you want them taller or shorter, how short do you want them grazed? And it's not gonna be the same answer every time. It's gonna be really um, you know, adapted to where you are in the pasture improvement process. So I wanna quickly just go through the different categories of weeds. Um, so that we're not just talking about weeds as a big category because we've got annual weeds just gonna germinate and they're only gonna grow for one year. We've got um, biennial weeds that will germinate and then grow for two years. And then we've got perennial weeds, which are the ones that either will grow for several years or forever and ever in the case of Canada thistle. Um, <laughs> so the easiest weeds to get rid of are the annual weeds. And so step number one is figure out what your weeds are, actually identify them, um, and, then it, and then figure out is it an annual that germinates in the spring and just grows for the summer. That's a summer annual. So you can see we've got lamb's quarters here. Some people call it pigweed. Um, and we've got barnyard grass. So these are things that germinate in the spring and they grow all summer. So these are pretty easy to get rid of. If you've got a ton of them, they're gonna make a ton of seed. And so the way to, to deal with them is you know that you need to stop them from going to seed. Both of these weed species are highly palatable. So you're gonna be able to get rid of these with um, good grazing management by getting the livestock to consume them at the right time before they produce tons and tons of seeds. So your pasture might look like a weedy mess this year, but uh, if you can stop them from setting seed this year, then you're going to have less and less of them each year as you go, go through improving your grazing management. Then there's also this category of winter annuals, so chickweed. Um, again, this is really a palatable weed. It has a slightly different habit. It will often germinate in the fall or the very, very early spring and will then grow for one year, but it's able to overwinter these little tiny plants. And um, chickweed incidentally is also delicious. Um, and so you can eat it as well as your livestock as part of your strategy for getting rid of it. This is a very low growing plant. So it's gonna be a lot harder to get complete um, prevention of it from going to seed. So there's a few of these kind of low growing um, annual weeds that you'll just have to look out for. My experience with chickweed and these low growing plants is they're also very intolerant of trampling. And so if you do some intermittent high density grazing in your pasture in the areas where you have these low growing creeping annuals um, or biennials or winter annuals, you're gonna pretty quickly move your pasture into a new um, phase where you're gonna have more of the high quality cool season perennial grasses and legumes. So now we can talk about the biennials. Um, these have a really different growth habit and you've got two different years where you need to deal with them differently. So the, the biennials in the first year make these little um, rosettes. Um, so you can see here's a burdock plant in its first year. And um, there's also a couple of little bitty ones um, down underneath in the canopy here that are even smaller. Um, 
with the little tiny burdock leaves, you might not even notice them unless you're like literally getting down on your hands and knees and crawling around in your pasture and looking at what is down under the plant canopy, which is something you should be doing all the time in your pastures. Um, so in year one, they're gonna be small and you won't really notice them. And that's the best time to get rid of them. Uh, and so if you can get some trampling impact and some good grazing management that year and really do some management to boost the competitive um, growth ability of your cool season perennial grasses and legumes, you'll get rid of a lot of these biennials in year one when they're just from leaves. In year two, you can see the cows here. Um, this is on a grass fed dairy farm in uh, New York state. Um, there was only one burdock plant in that pasture. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the cows, the first thing they did when they went in there is they ran in and ate it. Um, and so it's a very palatable plant. You can get rid of it. Um, but this is what it looks like in year two, where it gets the really big leaves and then has the big stall, tall stem and produces the seeds. So that's a relatively easy to get rid of biennial because it's palatable. So now let's talk about the non-palatable ones. Mm -hmm. So, um, your thistles include biennials and perennials. So this is bull thistle in year one. You can see there's a whole bunch of little bitty ones germinating and then one is now um, big enough that it's got some prickles. And so this is what it looks like in year one. In a pasture, you're probably gonna not notice it unless you're walking around barefoot uh, and you'll notice these little tiny rosettes with prickles on them. So that's year one um, bull thistle. And um, it is in year two. It hasn't yet started to make its big, tall, you know, Christmas tree height in some cases, um, you know, stem with the big purple flowers. Uh, but once year two happens, then your main goal is doing what you can to clip off those seed heads or maybe trample it so that you can stop the seed production. All of these biennials come in when you have low plant density and you are providing the opportunity yeah. for these plants that produce tons and tons of seeds to land on the soil surface and germinate in that year one. Um, so the strategy is stopping them from producing seeds and then also really working hard to maintain very high plant density in your pasture. So you can't see any soil. So even when these seeds get produced, they won't be able to germinate and survive in your pasture. So one of the weeds I'm seeing a lot more of now is um, Queen Anne's lace. And um, some people also call it wild carrot. It has the white flowers. Uh, in year two and in year one, it just looks like this little bit of fluffy foliage down in the base of your pastures. And particularly in places that are having uh, dry, extended dry periods or even droughts during the grazing season that you haven't experienced previously, that allows these, um, it, it decreases the plant density in your pasture by uh, killing or damaging your shallower rooted, less drought tolerant grasses and legumes. So your white clover, your um, Kentucky bluegrass, in some cases, maybe even your meadow fescue isn't doing as well. And so you've got these thinner pastures and then all of a sudden Queen Anne's lace is just amazing at producing zillions of seeds. And so it'll germinate that first year. And if you're not paying attention, you will not notice it. And then year two, if, when you have that next dry period, this is a tap-rooted biennial. Um, so is the bull thistle and so is the, um, the burdock that we talked about. So in year two, if it's dry, it's got this beautiful taproot. It's able to get lots of water and it can outcompete all of your shallower rooted pasture plants. And so that year two strategy again is you're gonna potentially need to either clip or mow or do good grazing management that prevents these from producing seeds. And it might take you a couple of years, especially with the Queen Anne's lace to get this one under control. Sarah, is, is Queen Anne's lace palatable? 
Queen Anne's lace is very palatable um, for most livestock, but I have visited several farms where um, there's so much of it that the animals are starting to um, probably get post-ingestive feedback saying, okay, you've eaten too much Queen Anne's lace. You need to go eat something else. And they're starting to leave more and more of it behind. And so on those farms, we've either had to add in a different class of livestock, like adding sheep or goats um, to a, a cow operation, or we've had to start doing um, quite a bit of post grazing clipping with the mower set just high enough to clip off the flowers before it produces seed. And that's related to um, another question that's coming in with the Q&A, which is which um, weeds are just unpalatable and actually dangerous or poisonous to our animals? Yeah, great question. So um, I've got a couple photos of some of the weeds I've actually seen cause um, poisoning that I'll show in a little while. Mm -hmm. um, there's, this is a weed here. This is the wild chervil that is poisonous to us humans. It causes that skin reaction. It's in the same family as the wild carrot or Queen Anne's lace, um, but it has a different colored flower and much larger leaves. But this is what it looks like when it's in the young vegetative stage. So this is a plant that's actually poisonous to us, but not to our livestock. They, they will graze this stuff. And there's quite a few farms who are using grazing management to control that, um, that weed. Um, so, your favorite, Matt, um, <laughs> Canada thistle. <laughs> so Canada thistle, so now we're going to talk about the hardest weeds to control. These are perennial weeds, so they're not just growing for two years or one year, um, and some of them have these unbelievable root systems that are spreading. So this is, you know, if you're growing vegetables, this is going to be your quack grass, um, but quack grass in a pasture is great. Um, but in a pasture setting, this is stuff like the, um, the Canada thistle. Um, here's an example of one of the ways to get more Canada thistle in your pastures, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. which is do, um, you know, do high density grazing or bale grazing when the soil conditions are wet and saturated. Um, so you can see on the right hand side, this farm, they've done a lot of damage to their soil structure by having the livestock have access to the pastures when they're really wet. Uh, and then um, a, about a month or two later, there was just a little tiny bit of Canada thistle in there, but now it's spread like mad. So a lot of times I find if I go in with a soil penetrometer, I'll find the areas where the Canada thistle is really thriving on the farm has very compacted soils and this thistle really has a competitive advantage in this case. And so you can sometimes get rid of it by just doing really good grazing management, spreading compost, clipping it a little bit, but trying not to damage the grasses underneath it and around it too much by overly clipping and mowing them. And just doing everything you can to encourage that the soil to get lighter and fluffier, build soil organic matter, get those grass roots pulsing down to grow deeper and then get grazed off and die off and start to get the biological activity in the soil to break up that compaction. If you go in there with tillage equipment, like a chisel plow or a key line plow or something like that, you may end up making it worse by breaking the roots up and spreading it around. Uh, so I always try to do sort of strategic grazing and clipping first and pay attention to the soil compaction and soil health before doing the, the tillage in the soils where these spreading ones are. Another one I wanna mention is horse nettle. This one is also very difficult to get rid of because it makes those little berry-like seeds. Uh, and then it also has um, a rhizome root that will spread around and it can get quite hard to get rid of. Both of these are prickly, low palatability, or for most farms, no palatability. I, I do know some folks have gotten their livestock to graze them. Um, tall fescue is another one with palatability issues. This is an arm that the tall fescue and their perennial, very diverse mix planted. But over time, 
there chose to eat every other grass and loom in the pack and very lightly graze the tall fescue. So it was able over time to really take over the pasture. This is actually a farm that ended up choosing to use a small amount of targeted herbicide to kill the tall fescue uh, and then do a bit of reseeding to um, change it over to an orchard grass perennial mix instead of a tall fescue perennial mix. So Sarah, in some areas of the country, tall fescue is going to be a great plant. In other areas, it's not going to be good for your climate. So you, that's related to a very popular question that's coming in about timing. The timing to spread uh, manure to spray, um, you know, what, are, what is the timing for doing that kind of intervention? So in terms of fertility inputs, um, fall and spring are always the, the best time for a lot of those. It's a very soluble fertility that you're putting and you're in the Northeast where we have high rainfall events. You're probably going to want to do that in the spring so that you don't have too much of it washing out of your pasture. Um, but if you're spreading something like um, a semi-rotted manure, solid manure or compost, you might want to do that in the fall so that you have time for that to break down a bit, get into the soil a bit, so that you don't have palatability issues in your pasture when you're grazing it. Um, one interesting thing I've seen a few farmers do is um, use liquid manure strategically in the areas where they have Canada thistle. Uh, after grazing and kind of stressing out the thistles um, in an area they'll spread liquid manure. Um, and I can't tell if it's actually like burning the thistle foliage. It's just encouraging nitrogen response in the grasses. Um, but in those areas, I've seen the grasses really start to take over and squeeze out the thistles over time. And those are manure applications of liquid dairy manure uh, that's, that are happening during the grazing season after um, after a couple of grazings, so maybe after the second or third grazing of a paddock. Mm -hmm. um, there is a question um, about sedge appearing. That's a very popular um, question. I'm, I include myself as well. I have a lot of sedge. So uh, I, I imagine you have a slide or you can talk about eliminating sedge. You know, I I forgot to put in a sledge. I might later on, I could probably, um, but yeah, let's, let's talk a little bit about that before we go into the poisonous plants, because the, um, I, I think that this is again related to, um, oh, I just noticed there's sedge in this slide. Um, <laughs> um, can you guys see my pointer if I wiggle it around here? Yeah, I can. Okay, cool. Yep. Okay, so Matt can see it. I assume everybody can see it. So this is a wet area um, on the, the edge of a pasture. You can actually see there's some cattails down in the really wet area and up here in the forefront. The plant that we're looking at right here is one of the few plants that I've actually had cause um, poisoning in um, livestock. It's false hellebore. Um, and, um, but here are all of these little things that look like grasses. Um, and those are sedges. It is not in the, the grass family. It's a, a category of plants. And so again, this is where if you don't know the difference between a grass and a sedge, you should be spending more time crawling around on your hands and knees, parting the plants in your pasture and looking at your plants and learning some plant identification. Sedges have triangular stems. So if you pick a sedge, it, it looks like a little triangle at the base and they are um, wetland adapted species. And so as we have more and more high rainfall events, or if you have for some reason soils that have become very compacted over time and aren't draining as well, to have the opportunity for sedges to become more and more competitive in your, in your pastures. Um, they also have um, little pieces of the roots that will break off. And um, so even if you're doing tillage to reseed, they'll a lot of times come right back. And so if you're really trying to eradicate sedges, a lot of times if you're doing tillage, it's one of those plants where you need to potentially grow an annual crop for a year. So it might be one where you 
till it up and you grow a crop of millet or sorghum sedan grass or something like that and graze that or harvest that for feed over a season and then you the next then you might do an overwintered um, you know winter cover crop of you know winter rye or something and then maybe the next spring you've eradicated those little bits of roots um, of those problematic sorts of weeds and you can seed down to a cool season perennial legume mix. Um, but sedge is also not gonna be competitive once you really get your cool season perennial grasses growing deep, deep roots and having enough nitrogen to be able to grow competitively. So again, it, one of the, the ways to look at weeds is don't look at the weeds. <laughs> um, so it, it doesn't always work, but for a lot of the weed species, if you shift your sort of focus from being really annoyed that your path of weeds instead shift focus to the cool season perennial grass species and the legumes and ask yourself the question of why are they not able to be so vigorous and competitive that they can outcompete these weeds without me needing to do tillage or use herbicide or drive my tractor around you know for days every summer doing the mowing. And so really shifting back to that kind of the pyramid that I showed in the early slide of like, well, what can I do with my soil fertility and with my grazing management to make these grasses and legumes healthier, more vigorous? Um, and then a lot of them will, will go away. So if you have a ton of sedges in your soils, the other thing to think about is your soils may not be suited to being pasture. They might be wetland soils that have a high water table seasonally for um, days or weeks or even months each year that are not going to allow your cool season perennial grasses to be able to grow. And um, so that's you know where you wanna pull out your soil map and um, see if you've got hydric soils or wetland soils and that you're trying to do something with them that they're just not well suited to. So um, anything else on that, Matt, or should we dive into poisonous plants? Go ahead, dive in. Okay. <laughs> so um, at the risk of oversimplifying things, um, in the 20 some odd years, I think it might be now 30, I don't know how long it's been, I think it's been 30 years that I've been doing this sort of work. Um, I have very, very rarely had to deal with any sort of serious acute toxicity of livestock in the pastures. So if, if you have animals on your farm that have been there, especially if they've been there for a few generations and you've got poisonous plants all over the place in your pastures, most of the time you're never gonna have any problems. The time that I see problems with poisonous plants is usually when new animals come to the farm and they're meeting novel foods that they've never experienced before. That's when I've had, um, there's only twice that I've had toxicity issues with this false hellebore. Um, and one was um, some young weaned calves that just got off the trailer and they didn't know what this was. And so one of them ate a leaf and keeled over dead in about um, three or four hours. Um, might've eaten a couple of leaves. Um, it was very easy for me to figure this out because it was lying there dead with a false hellebore leaf in its mouth the next morning. Um, but here's some sheep who are grazing in a pasture that's full of false hellebore and mm. have been for you know more than two decades and there's never been any toxicity issues because they know that they don't wanna eat this. Um, it's kind of a stinky plant. If you pick a leaf and smell it, it smells sort of weirdly skunky. It's actually the plant that is most likely to send Vermont people to the emergency room because it's too cold up here for skunk cabbage to grow, but people come from, they'll come to Vermont and they'll see this plant and with the new interest in foraging, they'll say, oh, it's skunk ca cabbage and they'll eat it and end up in the emergency room. Um, it's really very toxic. I don't do anything to control this plant though. It's kind of cool looking. Um, and 
you know, it's only going to be a problem for livestock that just don't know what it is yet. Um, and it's also potentially going to be a problem for livestock if it's a drought and you're running out of forage in the pastures or you're um, overstocked and running out of stuff for them to eat in the pasture. That's when the other time that you'll see toxicity issues in the pastures. So the, the other time that I've found this has caused some poisoning and death um, in uh, cattle was um, a farmer that just was overgrazing their pastures. It was a continuous grazing system. And at a certain point in the summer, the cows got hungry enough that a couple of them ate this stuff. This is another one that I've run into um, toxicity with twice. Um, this is a uh, white baneberry and um, this is a forest plant. <laughs> and um, the only time I've found toxicity is the pastures are being grazed down short, the animals are getting hungry and they literally were getting down on their knees um, and like reaching under the fence into the forest and just eating everything because they were hungry. Um, and this, this caused um, uh, death and illness in several dairy cows. This is, um, this is St. John's wort, um, which is a really interesting medicinal plant. I've not ever had this cause death in animals, um, but it causes photosensitivity in white skinned animals or animals that have some white skin um, if they start eating too much of it in the pasture. Um, so this is a lamb. Um, you can kind of see the backs of the ears are all gross and crusty. Um, this is the lamb that had a little bit of frisian in their genetics. And so the backs of their ears were really light for whatever reason. There's a couple of hundred sheep in this flock and, you know, three of them, I don't know, maybe they were feeling like they had seasonal affective disorder, which is what St. John's wort gets used for as a medicinal herb. So they ate a bunch of it and got sunburned and then all of the skin fell off the backs of their ears and it was very unpleasant for a while and they had to go in the barn to recover, um, but then they were fine. And I've had this also with um, Holstein Frisian um, dairy genetics where the cows, if they eat enough of it, they'll lose the white patches of skin. And Sarah, there's a question about goats because of how adventuresome they are. Um, are they more susceptible to eating these poisonous plants? No, that's an interesting question. I have had a lot more calls um, so the most common troubleshooting consulting job I get about toxicity is horses. Um, Cause lots of things are poisonous to horses that aren't poisonous to the ruminants. And horses are also just, I don't know, they're, <laughs> they're not as smart as cows and sheep and pigs. Um, and so they tend to eat the toxic things more often. Um, I have, I've almost never had toxicity issues in goats. Um, goats are incredibly smart and they have that little cleft upper lip um, and really muscular lips. Um, so they're able to very selectively eat exactly what they want and avoid everything else. And they're able to, um, you know, consume a lot of dry matter from browsing and selectively grazing. And I think that also allows them to avoid eating the, the poisonous stuff. Thank you. Do you want to take a question or you want to uh, move into your next slide? No, you can, uh, you can go ahead. So we've got about um, 15 minutes left. I'm just looking at the time. Um, we've got a hard stop at, um, at 10, it sounds like. So That's right. um, yeah, are there some other topics that we haven't gotten to, to make sure we don't miss anybody's questions? So there's a question about when your trample methods are gonna show up in your soil test. Um, do you have uh, some idea of, of that? And uh, the modern, mon there's a question about uh, monitoring, monitor monitoring tools um, for uh, understanding uh, those trampoline methods. Yeah. So the, um, I, I, I didn't put in a slide. I don't think I did of, um, let me see. I didn't put in a slide of a soil penetrometer. 
but um, that is actually the soil measurement tool that I use the most um, in addition to a, a soil test or just digging holes in the pasture with a shovel as we walk around and, and look at things. Um, and um, so a soil penetrometer, I was just scrolling through my slides here to see if I had a picture of one. Um, you're not gonna wanna buy one probably. Oh yeah, here's one. Um, so that's a soil penetrometer. And um, you know, they're three or 400 bucks. Um, most agronomists that you might be working with um, will probably have one in their office or in their vehicle that you can borrow. And, you know, or you could host a pasture walk. This is a really cool way to be able to like walk around your farm with a whole lot of people once we're allowed to actually hang out with each other um, and make sure somebody brings a soil penetrometer. And that gives you a measurement of how compacted your soil is and at what depth in the soil it's compacted. And uh, that'll help you start to see if the trampling um, that you're doing in your grazing management is moving your soil in a way that's healthier. Like is that trampling incorporating organic material into the soil and then you're giving those soils a rest and time for the biological activity to incorporate that organic matter and the manure into the soil and increase um, that fluffiness in your soil or is the timing of your trampling actually sending things in the wrong direction and causing maybe surface compaction or a, a deeper level of compaction? So this is um, a gizmo that you um, just push down into your soils and um, the little gauge on the top tells you uh, how much pressure you're having to push down with to push it through the different layers of the soil. So that's one measurement technique that I think is really helpful. Um, to see how things are going. Um, I also like to just dig holes and, and look, you can get a sense of, you know, how deep down into the soil um, is that fluffy layer going? How deep can your soil roots go? In this case, we discovered we dug down a little ways and realized that the surface layer was really lovely, but we had an underlying hard pan underneath this that actually wasn't caused by the farmer, it was caused by glaciers. <laughs> um, and so we had this really, really packed stony layer underneath that was stopping the water from draining out of this pasture. And so we just had this natural limitation in the pasture where the roots couldn't go any deeper. Um, so these are, I think, the two most important ways to figure out if your trampling impact is good or not. Then if you're looking at your soil tests, what you're gonna be looking at um, for changes over time in that is gonna be what's the soil organic matter content. Um, and to a certain degree, you might also look at what is the cation exchange capacity in the soil um, is um, to get a sense of, of the organic matter content, but also then the capacity of the soil to hold some of those um, soil nutrients. Um, the, specifically, that's gonna be your um, magnesium and your calcium uh, and your potassium um, in the cation exchange capacities. Sarah, we're getting uh, several questions about deadly nightshade. Um, so uh, might as well address that one, I think. Yeah, so I have been waiting life to see a deadly nightshade <laughs> um, cause a bunch of animals to die. Um, Cause it's really poisonous. Um, it's poisonous to us, it's poisonous to the livestock. Um, and I mean, goats are a great example. A bunch of the goat farms that I've worked with have had just these vining bushy areas that seem like it's mostly deadly nightshade. And I always show it to the farmer and say, you know, keep an eye on this, make sure your goats don't eat this because, you know, the, I think they would die. Um, and um, it's never happened. And so, um, it, and it's, it's an interesting plant. It's in the same family as the, the horse nettle. It's in the Solanaceae family along with the, to, the tomatoes um, and, um, and potatoes. Uh, it's just one I haven't run into problems with. It hates being trampled. I mean, you can drop a round bale on top of it, you know, and bale graze it out of existence pretty quickly. Usually mm -hmm. it's growing up along the fence lines and the hedgerows where you don't have that 
that hoof impact. So as strange as it sounds, I just haven't run into it as a poisonous plant. Um, and that is the case with almost all of the poisonous plants on the poisonous plant list. So a, a lot of times when I'm working with a new grazer um, that's just gotten their livestock and is just setting up their grazing system, we'll go through and do an initial plant species composition scouting of their grazing system. And we'll find a dozen potentially poisonous plants in there if we're looking at the, you know, poisonous plant book, you know, or some of the plant identification poisonous plant handouts that are available through UVM or somewhere. Um, and, um, and then that farm will never have any problems with plant toxicity if they're doing a really good job with their grazing management because there's always non-toxic plants in the pasture for the livestock to be able to graze. So it's mm -hmm. good to be able to identify them, but you know, don't get freaked out about them. And also some of the plant species that show up on those poisonous plant lists, like milkweed, for example, um, the milkweed species that we have here in the Northeast um, is pretty palatable. Um, the buttercup species we hear, have here shows up on the toxicity list, but it's only mildly toxic and it mostly is a palatability issue just because it irritates the mucous membrane. So they won't want to eat it very much, which is why it spreads like crazy once you get it into your pastures. So we have seven minutes left um, and I want to be mindful that you had a, a nice sort of closing slide that you were about to go to before I asked you about more weeds. Do you want to go to that or take one more question? I think let's just keep taking, let's just keep taking questions. Okay, so there's a question, a very popular question of what do you think about pasture cropping uh, and interceding stuff? <laughs> okay, so um, yeah, interceding. Um, if you have a high density pasture, um, interceding isn't going to work. <laughs> because you have managed your cool season perennial grasses and legumes to a point where nothing else is going to be able to grow. Um, you know, so here's a, here's a slide of just a gorgeous pasture that has different species of legume in here. There's alfalfa, there's red clover, there's white clover, there's bird's foot trefoil, um, there is um, orchard grass, there's um, smooth brome grass in here. There's a little bit of meadow fescue and some perennial ryegrass. And then we've also got some uh, other species in here. This one in the middle is pretty much my favorite um, plant other than maybe bird's foot trefoil. This is a uh, forage chicory, which is a, a tap rooted plant. You know, so if you have a pasture like this, you're just gonna be managing for perennials. And this is probably going to be the least amount of input costs for you, other than maintaining soil fertility. And, um, and it's going to produce dairy quality feed or, um, you know, fit animal quality feed. And you're not ever going to need to go in there and think about, you know, drilling in other species if you're able to just maintain this with good grazing management. So I would say that's the goal that we should really be aiming for. I have had very mixed results um, in drilling in, you know, um, annual species into existing pastures. So things like, um, you know, I'd, like I'd love to be able to get some warm season annuals growing in the pasture mid season. Um, but the most effective way in my experience to grow those is if you've got a problem area in your pasture and you have the tillage equipment and you want to go that route is just till up your problem area in your pasture where you're sick of trying with good just good with just good grazing management to improve an area do the tillage grow an annual crop for grazing or as a crop for the year and then the next year or that fall seed it down to one of these really improved perennial mixtures. So I see that sort of rotation through an annual crop into a perennial for most of the farms I work with, that's a better route than trying to just um, intercede stuff um, if it's annuals. So the, the one thing we haven't talked about is what are the in-between things? We talked about total tillage, we talked about good grazing management. So the other 
The other um, tools that you've got in your toolbox, um, one is frost seeding. So this is going out in the, uh, a lot of times it's traditionally done in the very early spring when you still have freezing and thawing conditions in the soils. Uh, maybe you can get out right before you get a, one of those spring heavy four inch um, wet heavy snowfalls. Uh, but you can also, with, with the legume species, you can do a late fall, early winter frost seeding before the snows come and, um, or even on one of those early wet, heavy snows. So this is where you will um, spread a relatively small amount of seed per acre can be really effective this way. It's usually most effective with your white clover and your red clover. And um, as little as two pounds to the acre maybe as much as eight pounds to the acre where you're spinning it right on over the soil surface in those low legume areas. You don't wanna do it until you know that your soil is going to have the right balance of fertility. So especially for those legumes, look at your potassium and your boron levels in those soil tests before you go spend loads of money on this. Um, but I particularly like red clover to frost seed into pastures because it's a taller growing, tap rooted legume. It's going to do a little bit better in the droughts than the shallower rooted white clover. It adds a little bit of height and density to the pasture and it's going to fix more nitrogen for those nitrogen hun hungry grasses and a lot of the farms in Vermont are really struggling to get enough nitrogen to make sure those grasses can be competitive. Frost seeding doesn't work so well for the grasses um, but sometimes it'll work. Um, so then the next thing ooh, in two minutes is, yeah. <laughs> um, is getting in there with a no-till drill. And so this is where you're pushing those seeds down into the soil. So you're gonna be able to have more with your plants like this um, forage chicory and all of your perennial grass species. Those all need really good seed to soil contact to be able to germinate and um, do well. And so in your medium and low density pastures, if you don't wanna do total tillage, you might be able to just get in there with a no-till drill and add those perennial species. Sometimes you can improve the success rate of that no-till drill planting by um, grazing the pasture abusively hard in the fall or the spring right before doing that. Um, and I can see Megan is back. <laughs> um, with her awesome Vermont Grass Farmers Association hat, giving us the one minute mark. Great. So I think with that one minute, um, maybe you want to give us one last thing to take away and then we'll direct everybody to go to chat because we can continue for a little bit of time on chat. Yeah. I would just say um, pay attention to the basic guidelines of good grazing management um, and don't get distracted by any fads. <laughs> Great. Um, so I want to thank you, Sarah. This has been very helpful to me. I know it's probably very helpful to others that were tuned in. And um, so thank you. And thanks for all of your scholarship and all your consultation. So yeah. very much appreciated. Thank you, Sarah. And I just wanted to um, uh, reiterate what Matt said, which is that the the Q and A in Whova, if there are unanswered questions, Sarah can access those and 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 type in a response. So, um, um, so you know, put your questions there. If you didn't get, um, I mean, if they're already there, there that's fine. But if you have more, put them there, and Sarah will get to them. You can, can that will continue to stay accessible um, even once the session is closed. So we're closing out now. The next sessions are at ten fifteen. Uh, we have practical pasture management skills with Juan Alves, and we have uh, Silvo Pasture with Steve Gabriel. So we will see you then. Bye, folks. Thank you.